the one from Kai Bailey in the Falls Church. Um, what was the atmosphere surrounding the broadsword and the beast sessions like? Well, the broadsword and the beast, it actually took about a year to record. And um, it started off, it, it didn't have a very good start because uh, we had an American producer <laughs> come to uh, to help us out. The record company suggested that we, we had this uh, chap who'd had um, lots of success with other bands. And uh, I forget his name now, to be honest. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all due respect to him but it didn't work out for Jethro Tull and we, w we wasted about a month at least and uh, a lot of energy into achieving nothing at all really um, and then it was decided that well we all thought you know Ian should produce it the rest of the band thought Ian why not he's, he's, he's a great producer and he knows exactly what he wants and so we restarted doing all the recording again um, up at Ian's studio uh, at Maison Rouge, which is a studio that he had in Fulham in London, a great studio. And we recorded many, many, many tracks. I mean, a lot of them came out later on after, after Broadsword, which incidentally is my favourite Toll album that I've been involved with. I, I really love the Broadsword album. And it was great fun, although it took a long time to make. And eventually we did employ Paul Samuel Smith, who was the ex-Yardbirds bass player, who was very beneficial, actually. It was nice having another pair of ears. And it was good for Ian to have somebody, actually, he, who could, you know, tell him what he thought of his vocals and, you know, just, just help out, really. It, it, it's hard doing everything yourself not to detract from Ian's abilities as a producer, but I think it really helped having Paul Samuel Smith along. And um, eventually the, the album, all of the tracks, I, I think on Broadsword are, are really great. It's a great sounding record. It took a long time to make. In fact, I'd given up driving from Cropredy, where I used to live in Oxfordshire. Every day I used to drive down the M40 and collect Ian from his house in Stoken Church because he, he doesn't drive or he doesn't have a license so I was kind of passing his house I'd collect him and drive him to Fulham and we'd work till about 8 or 9 o'clock at night and then drive back and I was doing this for about 3 or 4 months and in the end um, I gave up and I, I took like um, a camp bed down and stayed in the studio um, and then I also stayed in Jerry Conway's flat. Jerry lived, uh, I think, in Fulham, not far away, or not far away from um, fr from the from Maison Rouge. So uh, in the end, uh, Jerry kindly put me up. But um, it was a great album, and it was it was great fun to to, to make. I re I really had a good time doing that, despite the length of time that it took. And and the question from Kai again. What are the major differences in the way Fairport and Tull function as a band? Well, the Fairport, as I, I mentioned earlier in one of my other replies, has always been a very friendly kind of bunch. Um, we kind of, <laughs> we gave up on the music business years and years ago, and we kind of, we've always stumbled along in whatever manner felt right at the time. It's We've never taken ourselves very seriously. Um, and we've always been kind of a good time band. Um, we're a bit more professional now we're older, but it, we, it's always been like a bunch of mates who've enjoyed playing music together. Uh, Jethro Tull isn't like that, really. It's kind of Ian's, very much Ian's thing, and the other guys kind of... Well, it's Ian and Martin's thing, obviously, but, but the other guys have always been kind of employees, really. Although I must say that I was very well looked after when I played with Jethro Tull and, and Ian and Martin were, were very fair with me and very helpful and uh, without their kind of help and the fact that they looked after me financially very well allowed me to set up our studio and in fact, you know, do all the other things which helped keep Fairport Convention going because I learnt an awful lot from Ian's leadership in Jethro Tull and the way he did things, and um, I, I think Fairport really benefited as a result of that. 
Has there ever been an urge to hit the road with Tull again? Well, not really, because as I mentioned earlier, I, I, I think it was all too much for me. I, I, I really enjoyed it. I, it was an incredibly exciting experience, but I don't think it would be the same again. And obviously, times have changed and we've all got a lot older. <laughs> and uh, I, I've, I've enjoyed getting back with Tull on the couple of occasions when I've, I've joined them on stage for a few numbers. And uh, no problems doing that again, but I, I don't think um, touring is a possibility. This is one from Greg in Detroit. Uh, well, the suburbs of Detroit, as no one actually lives within the city limits, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> Dave, I saw you with Tolan Fairport at a concert in Detroit in the late 80s at Cobo Arena. I believe Fairport had just released in real time. You were on stage throughout the entire sets with Fairport and Toll. Did you do that for the entire tour or was that merely at selected venues? Man, talk about a performance. Don't tell Ian, but Fairport st whoops, stole the show. I better not say that last bit. Um, yeah, I did it for the whole tour, Greg, and it was, um, it was actually great fun. It was... Um, it wasn't as hard work as, 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 as you'd imagine because the Fairports only played for about 45 minutes and then there was like a 20 minute interval uh, where I got changed in, into my toll outfit and moved to the other side of the stage and then did the toll set. I mean, it was great. Um, people go, oh, it's all right, you're on double bubble. You got, you're getting like paid twice for it. But in fact, the Fairports, <laughs> the Fairports set, we just about got through that to by the skin of our teeth um, expense wise because we had to employ four road crew and two camper vans to get the band and the road crew around in America. They nearly killed themselves in the in the snow and it was really bad for them. And I was flying with Jethro Tull so it was pretty easy for me. I felt so sorry for my Fairport chums because they really had to rough it. But um, Island Records gave us some money to to make that album in real time, Live 87. And we spent it all on funding the, the tour because uh, we were getting paid about $1,000 a night from Jethro Tull. But the cost of doing the tour was about $2,500 a night. So um, it wasn't, I, d I didn't make a fortune doing it. I, c I couldn't retire at the end of it. And the other sad thing about it was it meant I missed my table tennis every night because uh, before that, on the previous tour, I'd played for a couple of hours. We'd, we used to get to gigs at 4 o'clock, then play table tennis till 6 o'clock when we weren't doing sound check. And um, we got really good at table tennis. Martin Barr is a superb table tennis player. And I did okay. Um, but my form really went down when I had to do the Fairport thing because the others got more practice than me. Bugger 